We are back on track. What a game. Welcome back to Charge On. As always, I am your host, Sean Green. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for subscribing, liking, sharing, doing all those things. We greatly appreciate it. It is 1136. Just got done with the UCF game. Uh, Again, everything we say, we are going to talk strictly from what we saw. We are going to take into account the opponent because we have to do that. But I think the best thing that we can say coming out of this game is there were improvements from last week where you can say the trajectory of this team is back on track where you could say, okay, stinker against Louisville, but came out and blew the doors off of an FAU team who regardless of who they played, has shown that their offense has done very well. Um, but we'll get into it. Very impressive win by UCF, beating FAU 40-14 to at home. Uh, I am joined, as always, by Robert Husby and Nick Geddes. Nick, just give your initial thoughts on the game. Or You know what? Before we start that, did you guys see the crowd? I want to talk about the crowd really quick. Everybody on Twitter was saying most attended FAU game but like pre-sale when it came to like student tickets and they're like it's been basically sold out there was like more UCF fans in a section than FAU fans at like a point in the game so like can you just give your guys thoughts on that because I I was kind of weirded out by that I was assuming it was a packed house but it was not or it didn't look like that I mean the student section was full they kept showing the student section and it was a pretty lively student section, I guess, for FAU. I mean, listen, they're used to playing Conference USA opponents, like, you know, what, Southern Miss, Louisiana Tech. I mean, if I was a student at FAU, it doesn't get me excited to go to a game, I'm not going to lie to you, on a Saturday night, especially a rainy Saturday night. But a UCF coming in, I, this is why I love these these inner, you know, state games that we don't get to see often. It always brings in a really good atmosphere and the UCF fans always travel. You hear, you heard it on all the kickoffs. They were there in full effect. Definitely helped the guys tonight. So I didn't have a problem with the crowd at all, to be honest with you. I just thought I was just expecting it to be like sold out. That was my, the way that they were presenting the game was the ticket sales are just through the roof. And most student tickets claimed the student section. It looked like that top, like, is the student section just that lower part and not the top Yeah, part? I think it was that lower part, yeah. Okay, because I was so confused. I'm like, is it just that lower part? Because, yeah, it was packed. Like, I'll give them credit for that, but I was, like, expecting just a little bit more. No shade to FAU, little shade, but, like, <laughs> no shade, but wasn't really impressed with the turnout. But I understand it's, like, who's actually living there, you know, whatever. Um, all right, Rob, uh, welcome, you know, welcome back. Thanks, uh, bud. How, how have you been? Uh, I know you're finally back. It's I know it's like a hassle to get you on sometimes, but the three um, amigos how, are back finally. It's, it's been thing. it's I been know, a, dude, oh yeah, finally. yeah. Technically, Nick wasn't on uh, last weekend, so I was gonna say it's only been a week. But since we've been all three of us, it's been a while. I know it's been a while. What are your initial thoughts on the game? Like, I think the good thing is it was a good stress. Like first quarter sucked. I mean we. I the stress was like, oh no, like here we go again. This is a must win, and here we go. But uh, how was it after the first quarter for you? Oh, much better. Um, I think the team was uh, much improved tonight. Um, they looked a lot better. They cleaned up a lot. They cleaned up the penalties, which was something me and you, Sean, talked about last week that they needed to do ahead of uh, this game and the future games down the line um, this season. Um, but I definitely think uh, a much improved. UCF. There's still still some things to fix, and we'll get into those, but much, much, much improved, and I think that's a lot. I, I think we can tell just by the tone already. We're a lot more upbeat than we were last weekend after uh, just an exhausting, exhausting game against Louisville. No, and, and I think that's the thing. It was a very exhausting mm-hmm. week on UCF Twitter, you know, and again, I, like, we were upfront honest, like, and I think that's the problem. Like, sometimes, like, hardcore fans. I saw on Twitter some UCF fans were just saying, like, you know, all this negativity and all this. And it's like, listen, as a true fan, you need to be negative when there's things to be negative about. You can't just say, oh, everything's going to be fine. I mean, because that's just not the reality. Like, watching last week, you said, listen, this was really bad. You need to clean these things up. 
or we're not going to be very good. And you have to overreact to some of these things, especially when it comes to quarterback play and stuff like that. But this week, much improved. So let's talk about John Rice Plumley first off because I think he deserves it. Clearly probably his best game maybe in college, I would say. Like obviously you have the LSU game. Maybe his best game throwing the ball. Let me say that because the LSU game where he ran for 250 I think is probably his best game. But this was a, a great performance. 339 yards passing with one TD, one interception. Uh, the one interception was really bad. I think that's the one play in this game that I kind of was like, okay, what was that? Um, but I think this is the first time, Nick, tell me if I'm wrong. This is the first time with him rushing the ball where I saw maybe SEC John Rice where I'm like, oh, okay, this is what I was wanting to see. 20 carries, 121 yards, and two TDs. To me, my main takeaway here was definitely John Rice Plumley and the improvement we saw from one week to the next. And, you know, Danny Cannell did a really good job of pointing that out on the broadcast of this is the perfect guy for a Gus Malzahn system. And now, usually when I hear the word system, I think, you know, you can have all the systems you want, but the players you have in place, that's your system, in my opinion. I've never been a fan of trying to mold guys into your system, but John Rice Plumley clearly is what he wants. And Danny Cannell, he even name-dropped Nick Marshall, who, if you recall, beginning of the season, I said, I think that's what John Rice Plumley, if he's going to have upside here, it's going to be that Nick Marshall type guy. This is the first quarterback Gus Malzahn has had that I think has truly been in that Nick Marshall mold, which is when Gus Malzahn had the most success. But tonight, when you have 452 yards by yourself in a game, I mean, to me, there were some hiccups. You talked about the interception I think all things considered as close to a perfect game that you could ever play as a quarterback in this system. John Rice Plumley did that. And you look at the way he was running and physical, very physical. I mean, if he was an NFL quarterback, I'd be sitting here saying, God, please, please stop getting hit. Please stop. Please stop throwing caution into the wind. But he's a warrior. I mean, I saw his helmet bounce off, bounce off the field a couple times. I mean, the air plumley moment when he went in. I mean, who did that remind you of? Wearing number ten, by the way. I mean, that Memphis. It, it brought me back to that Memphis game years ago. Exactly. I mean, exactly. I mean, we me got back. no. He changed jerseys at some point in the first quarter. No name on the back. That needs to stay. Okay, that's his identity. No name plumley on the back. Air plumley. So yeah, I think it was a fantastic outing. For John Rise, and for me, somebody who criticized him pretty heavily last week, and I said, hey, I'm not tied to any quarterback. But to go out there and, you know, we said it, or at least I said it, if you're going to win the game, you've got to do it through the air. I need to see some improvement through the air. And, of course, the UCF rushing attack was fantastic. But he did more than his fair share through the passing game to complement things. And you get what you got. I mean, 92 plays run. When you do that and you have 400-something yards, I don't know how many games you're really going to lose. No, yeah, and I think, like you said, when he was running the ball, like he's one of the toughest guys I've seen at quarterback you know, in a while, like just the way that he, he leans in to, you know, those hits, he does not shy away. The, the one play that really stood out to me, which is not really a play that probably would stand out to most is when he slid and he just gets decked, like he gets decked and he gets right up and points at the guy and walks. I'm like, that takes a dude, man, like to get rocked from sliding and then just get right up and point. That kind of was like, okay, he's got this swagger about him this game where I think he heard everything, and we talked about it, right? Like, he heard all the people talking bad after that game. It was a really bad performance, didn't play up to standard, and he just came out. And I th- and we, me and Rob talked about it last episode where I said, like, you know, we we really want to see, you know, some some yards thrown. I mean, or I think it was me and Nick. I always get it mixed up now because I don't know ever who's my guest sometimes. But (laughs) I said, like, I want to see some yards. Like, I know FAU, you know, statistically this season has been, you know, they get to the quarterback, and we didn't think John Rice would have a lot of time because of the offensive line, you know, how they've played. And I said, I don't care. you got to throw him in this fire, and you got to make him throw some, some shots because just running the ball, we know that you can do that. We know you can get out of the pocket and make something with your legs. Let's see you throw the ball. Rob, I think he kind of did that tonight. I think he showed, yo, I can make these throws. You just got to give me a little bit of time here. Yeah, no, he definitely looked a lot more comfortable, a lot more 
uh, confident in his ability to throw. I mean, there was quite a few passing plays, uh, especially to Alec Holler, um, where he hit him, you know, several times uh, over while he was wide open, and Holler was able to get a big play out of it. There was that flea flicker in the towards the end of the third, start of the fourth. Um, there was that few flea flicker play that he pulled off. Um, and then there was, you know, a bunch of just run plays that John Rice even didn't really try against Louisville because he didn't seem confident in his offensive line being able to block for him and protect him. But no, I think you guys pointed to it too. I mean, besides his ability to pass in the air to complement his, you know, uh, rushing game, he just, he took a lot of abuse. Like he took abuse tonight. There was that, um, that targeting call. There was that, uh, of, of course, air Plumley. I mean, when you're, name tag is falling off your jersey. I mean the broadcast even pointed to that in the in the fourth quarter where he just, you know, that jersey was mangled. There's grass all over it. It's completely completely falling apart. I mean, that just goes to show you the heart of a warrior, the heart of a knight. I mean, that that really is what you see with John Rice Plumley and I think that I think that instills a lot of confidence in UCF fans' minds now moving forward is this guy can. I obviously it's FAU. It's not like a huge huge opponent, but I think that instills a lot of confidence in, in fans and the team saying, wow, this guy is willing to leave it all on the line on the field. No, and he, it was very impressive. And if he plays like that every game, I mean, the guy said on the broadcast, and I would tend to agree. I mean, UCF could go make a run where if you're playing like this, you could only end up with one loss at the, at the end of the season. So like, this is a good start. Let's listen. There are a lot of positives, a lot of positives. I mean, there's not many negatives that we can go into. I only have a couple, so let's get them done quick so that we can talk about all the good positives. I would say the first negative was mainly the first quarter. I think it, that it's just a terrible start, allowing so many yards. FAU was just moving the ball down the field. That's, I think, something that we need to clean up because that seems like it is becoming now. It's two games in a row where the opposing offense has just gone down the field and scored on you the first play. And I get the feeling out process of what you're going to do. But you can't allow a touchdown on every single opening drive and being behind and having to come back and answer. I mean, the offense looks good, right? Like, our offense comes on the field and it looks good, but we didn't go back and answer. We, we turned the ball over. So it's like... I think to start out, the defense, and we'll, we have a lot of positives. This defense proves that each and every week they might give up some yards, but they are, I think, going to be one of the top defenses in the nation, just the way I see them play. Um, but, Nick, what do you think? Like, If you're Travis Williams and you're talking to your defense, watching this tape, you're impressed, right? You guys played a hell of a game. But what can you change in the mindset of that first quarter specifically, maybe even first half, and say, like, listen, guys, we need to kind of come out guns a-blazing from the opening jump. We can't allow seven points on the board two straight weeks in your opening drive. Yeah, I mean, it is an issue. We've seen it now for two games in a row, and it, it definitely leaves your offense on a, on a hard way to, to get going there. But, you know, you give Travis Williams credit. He made the adjustments at halftime. He made those adjustments. So, and and honestly, if you give up 14 points in the first half, and that's really all you get out with, and we can harp on the first quarter, I tend to look at everything as a whole. 14 points is 14 points. It really oh, is. Yeah. And how many UCF defenses have we seen over the years? I mean, is this the is this one of the better, maybe the most talented and best well-rounded defense UCF has had over the past decade? It's always been just an offensive onslaught. And through three games, I'm looking at it, you give up, what, seven to South Carolina State, 20 to Louisville, and 14 to FAU. If I told you at the beginning of the year that's what they're going to give up in the first three games, we'd be sitting here telling you we're 3-0, and right? Unfortunately, the offense just couldn't get going against Louisville. It is what it is, and you move on. But, yeah. you know, I, I think that whatever adjustments he made in the second half, just stick with that. I guess it's, I think it's that simple. Just stick with that to come out and, and have that mentality. So, I don't think it's like a a schematic fix almost or something you could do there. I think it's just a mentality thing that you have to come out and say, hey, we're going to set the tone here and get it going. And and you see with that how they play in the second half these past two games. You're going to give your offense and your team every chance to win. So, uh, I'm, again, I, I, it's hard to find negatives in this game. 
really. Yeah. And I think you almost, you're almost reaching for one if you have to really talk about it, because I just think all things considered, you know, an almost perfect game, to be honest with you. No, it was. And I think I do agree. Like, obviously it is still very early and we don't, again, after week one, you don't like to, you know, make, you know, say things about this team because again, you can go next week and we can give up 50 points. So, but I will say if the running defense gets improved, I would agree. I, this might be one of the best defenses in the last, you know, decade plus for UCF. And that's saying a lot like, and again, I understand, you know, it, again, we keep saying it's game three, it's against FAU, but the way that they play, I, it's cliche, but they got some dogs on this defense, which I don't know if we could have said that in years past, especially the last couple of years. Um, let's go couple, two more turnovers. Obviously, rainy night. Um, so I don't want to necessarily go so deep into it. Obviously, need to protect the football. Got to make sure, no, like Gus will be the first one to tell you in his post game. Got to clean up on the turnovers. Can't have that happen. Because that was two touchdowns, honestly. That was, you know, you're basically marching into FAU territory and you're turning over the ball. Uh, so this score could have been much worse because who knows, um, with your new kicker, Colton Boomer, could have put up a couple uh, field goals uh, there if you're not scoring some touchdowns. Um, and then final thing I wanted to ask Rob, uh, Isaiah Bowser. Mm -hmm. So here's my takeaway, okay? Because I think everybody's going to wake up tomorrow and is going to say the same thing I'm about to say, but... They're going to say, he just, now, I go half and half. I go 50% offensive line because I think the way we're running our offense this year is so different from last year that our offensive line, whenever we're doing these, you know, just run up the gut. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, create, this is a very positive game, but it's apparent 13 carries for 33 yards for Isaiah Bowser, who in some games would have 13 carries for 120 yards last year. I don't know what it is. I think part of it is this offense is not creating those holes up the middle. Like the Matt Lee, like there's not a lot of holes. So it's like he's just getting stopped. I also just don't think Bowser looks the same as he did last year. I don't know if it's, you know, just him coming off of the injury, not looking the same. And I don't know what that is. What do you think it is? Do you think it's more on the offensive line or do you think it's just a decline in Bowser from last year to this year? I don't necessarily think it's a decline. I mean, he could certainly be dealing still with the, you know, the lingering issues of an injury. But I think what it really is, is I think it is the offensive line not being able to really create space up the middle. I mean, that was something that even, you know, prior to last year in Gus Malzahn, that was that UCF became a trademark for with, with their running offense was those big, big runs up the middle and those big spaces that the offensive line would create for them. Um, and you're just not seeing that. Everything that goes up the middle... Uh, and it's typically Bowser that carries it up the middle, gets stuffed. And, you know, it's being held to one, two yard, if not losses of loss of yards. So that's a big problem when everything re revolving around the run is being forced out to the outside or it's being forced into screenplays and stuff like that. Um, I mean, you see Johnny Richardson, how fast he is. He's just, I mean, he's just so fast and so quick, but everything he does is pretty much to the side. I mean, it's, it's nothing up yeah. the middle. It's nothing up the middle. So I think Bowser, you know, maybe if UCF can't figure out how to utilize their offensive line this year and really create that space up the middle, I mean, they might just have to manage with Johnny Richardson's, you know, quick speed being just forced out to the outside. And then when it comes to Bowser, just utilize how you've been utilizing them. If you need, you know, a third and one conversion, you put him out there. You need him for, you know, a uh, red zone play. You need him to get a quick touchdown because he already has like six touchdowns this season. You know, use him for that. I mean, if he's going to get you points, he's going to get you points. I don't really care how many yards Bowser puts up. I don't really care about the individual stats. If he's able to go out there and convert on third down or get you a touchdown when you need it, I, that's all I care about. No, yeah, and that's the thing, right? Like, it does. He might have a different role this year than last year. He's still, uh, you know, brute force when you know you have to, you know, tackle him, and he's very effective in the red zone. He scores pretty much every time he's in mm -hmm. there. And if you're third and one and you need a yard, I would feel very confident having John Rice and Isaiah Bowser back there because I know I would feel very confident getting a yard with one of them. 
Um, which actually brings me to my first positive. Let's get into positives because there's not that many negatives. A lot of it is nitpicking. This team did great today. It, a lot of the stuff was cleaned up. The offensive line did play really well. I mean, the offensive line cleaned up a lot of their problems. John Rice had clean pockets. I never felt like John Rice was, you know, having to rush and having to, you know, make a quick throw. Um, that also includes the running backs. The running backs did pick up the they, you know, FAU is running a lot of cornerback blitzes. And, you know, Johnny would give credit to Bowser and Richardson because they were picking it up and it was creating a clean pocket for John Rice. I think the big thing is penalties. And Nick, you know, we talked about it for the last couple of weeks. Penalties have killed this team. I think the sad is we are third in college football in penalties. Like, that is insane to think about. Uh, we'll be better this week. I don't think we'll be third after this week. Uh, only three penalties for 30 yards. So, clearly, I mean, Gus, it, it was an emphasis in practice. I mean, for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, Plumlee's going to get – the pub and he's going to be in the papers and he's going to be all over the place. And I'm sure a lot of the questions are going to be about him. But to me, it's like the offensive line, there's, there's nowhere to go, but up based on how they played against Louisville. In my opinion, there's nowhere to go, but up. And not only did they go up, they were the star of the show, in my opinion. And, and that's a valid criticism, by the way, that they're just not generating those holes for Isaiah Bowser, who I would add on to what Rob said. I think there's a, a little bit of a loss of his burst a little bit. Not that he's ever it's ever been his calling card, but it does seem like a little bit slow getting into his transgressions there when he's running with the football. It doesn't help that FAU, I mean, we knew that they're stingy against the run. Clearly, their deficiency against the run is to the outside. And I thought the offense ran a lot smoother when Johnny Richardson was in there. And we saw Johnny Richardson got 11 carries to Bowser's 13. He got the ball. I mean, you, talk, you factor in the catches. He got the ball more than, than uh, Isaiah Bowser did. And I think that might be a trend because the offense seemed to run better that way rather than having Bowser go up there and get a yard or two. But no, the offensive line, I mean, I said too, it's like I can bang the drum for Mikey Keen all I want. But if the offensive line is not going to block anybody, what good is it to do to throw Mikey Keen in there or Castellanos in there or whoever? And in this game, they gave John Rice Pumley every opportunity to air it out and he had that trust in there. I mean, 36 pass, 36 pass attempts in this one. It's more than he did against Louisville, right? And completing, you know, damn near 70% of them. That's what you want to see. That's what you want to see. And without good offensive line play, you can't do that. And the four penalties, it's like you can't have – that was, again, another major improvement. You can't have 10, 11 penalties every game and expect to win. Mm -mm. You just can't. And so you take four any day of the week and you run with it. So, again – massive improvement across the board offensively. But I think without the offensive line play tonight, it probably would have been a different story. No, 100%. And that's why if if this can stick, if the offensive line can play like that every week, I like my chance. I like UCF's chances in it, any game. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and we brought it up too, by the way, during the during the preview. FAU was third in, in the NCAA in sacks. Third. And they got to the quarterback one time. One time this entire game coming in third in the in NCAA in sack. So again, just a, another you know uh, improvement there for the offensive line. And that play that John Rice made, where they were pretty much they should have sacked him, and he just like backed up one, and like it was still a loss of a yard. But I mean that even helps. Even if they if they get to John Rice, you know that's why his elusiveness and getting out of the pocket is so crucial because. Yeah, I'm sorry if he's running around every play because he's about to get his head taken off because the offensive line's allowing you know guys to get through. I mean, yeah, that's probably taxing on John Rice. But if it's one or two times a game where he needs to you know get out of the pocket because a blitzer's coming, I mean, that's not as taxing on him. What's more taxing is getting like rocked when you're you know sliding to the ground. Mm -hmm. But um, right, and that and that reflect. I mean, that reflects in his play. I mean, you saw how much more confident John Rice looked in his throwing capabilities. Like he just looked. So, oh, I mean, he's, they had, he had, there's three right. drops too. He's, I mean, he should have actually been much better. Yeah. You know, completion. Yeah, and I mean, he just uh, he looks so much more confident. He was able to do his thing, and I think that's uh, that has a lot to do with the offensive line. And again, like you said, if he's scrambling around every game, of course you're not going to get you know the most use out of him. If he's scrambling around and running around all game, of course he's not going to try to rush because he's so busy trying to avoid the linebackers and the defensive line. So if they can keep that up, I mean, 
I think the sky's the limit for this UCF offense. Yeah. Let's finish out with the offense by talking about kind of two things that, well, no, three things that kind of get grouped together. So yards of total offense was 653 yards. I think from last week, the sigh of relief, that is UCF's offense. Mm -hmm. That is what UCF's offense does is they put up a lot of yards and they score a lot of points. Uh, Third down conversions. Last Again, it's all improvements from last week. They were 12 for 18 on third downs. I mean, if you... Do the, if you're going 12 of 18, you know, in a football game, I think most likely you're you're winning those games. Like if you're completing on third down and you're continuing to move those chains, I mean, you could beat anybody in the country if you're doing that. Depending obviously on the defense and stuff, but again, last week it seemed like UCF just couldn't get a third down conversion, and this week it was the confidence every time they were at third down is okay, they're gonna have some drawn up. But I also was like, oh, just run it with John Rice. You know, he had 121 yards rushing. Like, just run with him. And the thing I really want to talk about with you two is the better play calling. And that's why it kind of all gets grouped in, right? Some of those plays that Gus was calling up tonight, you're like, okay, this is an offense that we are used to seeing that keeping are keeping defenses on their toes. They don't, they're not expecting the same five plays in the playbook. Alec Holler got two of, like, basically, he was on the reception of two of those big plays where mm-hmm. you're like, they had no idea where the ball was going. And I think that, Nick, I'll start with you, like, that is kind of like, that's the Gus Malzahn offense we need to see each week. Just not the run up the middle, lateral, like, hoping that. It's, let's get some different play calls up in this playbook. Yeah, I think that's one of the, again, another valid criticism that I've had of Gus Malzahn since he's gotten to UCF is a lot of the things he promised and a lot of things he said were going to be, I don't think they really were. And they showed a really cool graphic, I don't know if you caught it on the telecast, of his coaching tree and all these offensive coordinators. And I'm looking at some of the names and I'm thinking about the creativity that those offenses have. And I'm just like, okay, but why does this offense where he's the godfather, so to speak, of these other guys who were under his coaching tree. Why does this offense not run that way? And to your point, very creative. I thought the play they got Alec Holler wide open down the seam was mm-hmm. just a master class, an absolute master class of how to get somebody open in a, in a scheme that. And you had guys running wide open all day and then taking advantage of of the mismatch. I mean, UCF is way more talented than FAU on that field. They're going to be more talented than every single team they play. I I look at the schedule. Find me a better receiver that's going to be on the field than Javon than Javon Baker also, who was fantastic again in this game. There's no doubt about it. He's the wide receiver one. Healthy dosage of Javon Baker in this game, and that's how it should be. You got to get your best players the ball. To his credit, he said, "I'm going to get Johnny Richardson involved." He did that as well. So I think that's a key. Is you got to scheme to get your best players the ball, and I think Gus Malzahn did a very good job of doing that tonight. Here's the thing I like about Gus and Rob. I, tell me if you agree with me, okay? I think one of the big problems with Heupel was there were so many obvious things on the field that you're like, why are you not changing this? And they would never get changed, and we would mm-hmm. just be seeing the same thing each and every week. And this week, you see the entire special teams redone, new punter, new kicker, and Johnny Richardson, we say, do you not see when he's on the field, everything runs better? He says, okay, puts him out there. And then again, when you you see the play calls, everybody was talking about the play calling. It's the same five plays. And then he comes out and does two or three flea flickers that get 40 yards passing in the defense completely had no idea what was happening because of the play design. Quick, quick flea flickers, not like five seconds to have it actual happen. Like quick pass, back, toss the ball. They had no idea. So it's like Gus, it, now Grin, I, I think Gus is just like open to changing things where maybe Hypel was like, eh, this is going to work. We're going to keep it the way it's going to be, and I don't care what anybody else says. Yeah, and I don't know with Hypel. I don't know if it was more – being stubborn, you know, stubbornness. I don't know if it was maybe being a little bit more incompetent, maybe both. Maybe it was stubborn and incompetent a lot of the times. But, yeah. I mean, the total joke and meme that, that happened with Hypel and Hypel's entire staff was, 
you know, oh, he's got five plays in the playbook, and if you can, you know, master defending against those five plays, you figure out a Josh Heupel offense. Um, and that trickled down. I mean, the same thing happened happened with Randy Shannon. Randy Shannon, on the defensive side, I mean, some of the worst UCF defense, with even with all that talent, I mean, just being wasted because Randy Shannon a lot of the time was too stubborn to change the defensive schemes when they weren't working. Um, so I think you saw that throughout Heupel's entire sort of, you know, uh, stay with UCF. So I think what I appreciate about Gus is, yes, there's clearly – there was clearly lacking um, in play calling on Gus's part last week, but now Gus is willing to not be a stubborn old man, a stubborn, you know, SEC, you know, veteran and saying, you know, I'm not changing anything. This is my way. I'm, you know, I'm sticking with what I know. No, he's actually willing to get new guys out there and trying something new, which I, I think everybody can appreciate. Oh, I pre- I loved watching it tonight. Absolutely. The offense was fun to watch tonight. It was a fun game to watch. Play calls were fun. It was fun. Besides the first quarter, it was really fun to watch. And if this is the offense and this is the defense, this is going to be like, again, it's 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 so early in the, the season that the last game left such a sour taste. But this, you know, this was a good taste of food. You know, this was a good taste of college football where you're like, we're back on track. Let's Let's move forward. Let's get back on track. Let's go to the defense. I mean, offense is great, you know, but I think the common theme of this season has been UCF is becoming a defensive mm-hmm. school, you know. Obviously, first quarter, a little bit rough, allowed 14 points. Here's some of the stats, and Rob, you brought it to my attention while I was doing the notes. Zero yards of offense allowed in the third quarter. They had three drives. Zero Yards of offense. Zero points scored from the second quarter on, so they didn't allow any points after the 14-point you know performance in the first. Uh, 13 yards allowed in the second half, I think. or uh, Yeah, 13 yards allowed in the second half, I think is what we figured out. We did the math, and we're like, oh, they only got 13 yards of offense in 30 minutes of football. So I personally think the play of the game, personally, was... Um, the Justin Hodges um, play, obviously, offense fumbles the ball, or they pick it off with the bad interception, get it to the one-yard line. Defense, one, two, third down. Hodges breaks it up. Great play on third down, and then the blocked field goal. Like, I mean, that, and we talked about it from the first game, right, when they, you know, again, fumble all the way to the one. This defense does not care where are they on the field? If they give up first downs to the the 50 and get in the territory, whatever. You're not getting points. And I think that is, Nick, that's what really makes me, like when I'm looking at this game and I'm looking at this defense, I'm like, okay, if this, regardless of the offense, we're going to be in every game. I don't think that there's a game on this schedule where we're going to get blown out because we can't stop a team like last year at SMU. I don't think that this defense is going to be getting blown out by 20 points. Yeah, and I think the secondary is turning into the strength of this defense at the moment. I mean, Justin Hodges. Where it was a weakness from years. Where it was a weakness years for years. Ago, a weakness. For years. I mean, I, I covered this team under the Randy Shannon regime, and it, it was yeah. – <laughs> Pitiful, absolutely pitiful in the back end that UCF used to be. And it's a, it's a lot different now with Justin Hodges it being your cornerback one. I mean, he made the play of the game in the end zone, sticking his hand in there and getting physical. I mean, that's what you want to see. And I don't think we've saw that from other UCF defenses in the past. But I'll tell you what was the key to this UCF defense tonight. And this is why I'm even more encouraged. Did y'all notice who didn't play tonight on defense? Go ahead. Jeremiah John Baptiste did not play tonight. He did not play. Kind of a surprise. We did, I don't really think we had much kind of heads up on that. They kept that tight to the chest, but he did not play in this game. And why I'm you encouraged by killer? that. Who, who, like, well, there's one of my defensive studs tonight that I'm it, like. Jason Johnson. It's got to be yeah. Jason Johnson. And we didn't talk about him much in these previews about the portal. Again, the portal, you can change so much in the transfer portal, and this is a guy who comes over from Eastern Illinois. Uh, He was a first-team all-linebacker in that conference, and we didn't talk about him much, but with no Jeremiah John Baptiste, he goes out, 
commands the defense, leads the defense, 10 tackles. I mean, to me, without – I think Jeremiah John-Baptiste is probably the most important player in the middle of that defense, but Jason Johnson being able to step in there and do his job, and, and of course Yates as well, he had plays that he made also. That's what makes me so encouraged about this defense is when – what do you do when adversity strikes, when you don't have one of your best players? And a guy like that who has not played a lot of high-level football in his collegiate career – and to step right in and do that tonight, that's my biggest takeaway from this defense is Jason Johnson, who we need to start talking about more. No, we do. And I think we talked about the depth early on, and I think it's showing now, right? Guy goes down, guy can't play, and you just see the depth on the team. Honestly, though, I know we talk about him all the time. Josh, Sel- Josh Selzgar is like maybe yeah. – the most important defensive player in the last couple of years. He was in every single play. When I'm watching on defense, I was sometimes just watching him. He blew up maybe like seven plays on defense. And I'm like, wow. If I think he's probably one of the most, if not the most, crucial part to this defense. If for if we didn't have him, I think we'd be talking about the defense a little bit differently. Like they'd still be great. But the plays he was making tonight. Like especially early on in the game where we were struggling, he kept us in some of those plays where we had no business doing anything in that game. So I think he's like my defensive MVP. I think we can all agree like he's if he's not your defensive MVP, he's like number two or number three at this point. He's incredible. And then Traymon Moore is brash. I mean, just another guy that goes under the radar sometimes that we like – we talk about him, but like maybe not enough as we should. He made some killer plays tonight where I'm like, again, it's it's not just these guys, but it's the entire defense. And I mean, to only allow 13 yards of offense for, again, and I know they haven't played many people, but the number nine offense in the country, again, I understand, didn't have a, you know, they played Ohio. Like, I get it. But this offense, I will say, I was a little hypocritical, or in the first quarter, I was very negative i was like i'm so like i was gonna title this like the fau offense is basically turned themselves into the old ucf offense because that's what it looked that's like a long title. i mean it literally looked like yeah it is long. like <laughs> i would have probably shortened it if i had time you know that was just what I, i'm like i can't deal with this um but it very quickly the defense just shut it down they're like yo you are the little brother i mean I would rather be an FAU than USF, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm just very impressed, and I think to hold Perry to 108 yards and a touchdown, the rushing is a problem, I mean, but again, it's a bend-don't-break, and if we're going to be a bend-don't-break defense this year, I'm fine with that. I mean, we don't need, like, when you allow 14 points for a team that put up over 38 points for the last three games... I mean, I'll take that. I will we'll take that every game. I'll give up as many yards as you want. Just when it gets into the red zone, hold them to three or zero. Yeah, and I think what this defense has showed, and I think why we can even mention, I mean, we're three games in, but I think why we can mention that this has the potential to be one of the best defenses we've seen UCF field within the last decade um, is because they have so many similarities to that 2018 uh, Peach Bowl team. I mean, they have guys that are capable of making big plays. And I think that's what the most important thing about, you know, UCF's defense in 2018. Yeah, I mean, when they played like Memphis, they allowed a ton of points in that championship game. But the thing was, they would bend, not break, because they were able to make those big plays and those big stops and get a big interception at the right time. And that's what we've seen so far with this UCF team is – at least with the defense, they're able to make those big plays when they need to. They can get the, you know, they can get the stop. They can block a field goal. They can get an interception when they need to, and when it's important. And I mean, like mm-hmm. you said earlier, Sean, when they're able to make a goal line stand uh, and force you to do th- a three and out, like, I mean, what do you even say about a defense like that? That's just able to almost on command be like, okay, we're shutting this down. We're not allowed. We'll force you to a field goal. And then they can't even get They've a field goal out of it. They've done it multiple times. Yeah, they did it. They did it like too. Multiple times. They did it multiple times to SC State. So it's impressive. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, I think I'm more excited 
and I know the saying, I'm more excited to see where the defense will be by week eight than I am the offense. Because at least, like, and I know that can be surprising, right? Because the offense has struggled. I want to see how much better this defense can get. Is this the best it's going to get? Because, like, again, we're looking at the competition. I obviously want to see how this offense is going to improve. It can, if it can, you know, keep up this pace that we're showing. But if this defense can become a top 25 defense in the country, and it's kind of looking like they are, you know, you're you're on your way to a conference championship. I mean, there's a reason Cincy was where they were last year. It's because they had dogs on defense. You couldn't score on them. If we could be that this year, not saying we'll be Cincy, because, again, we're UCF. We don't need to be anybody else. If we can be a sound defensive team and can put up 30 a game, I think you'll see us basically in that final for an American Conference and, Championship. And, and, and by the way, deuces. And by the way, we talked about last week how the American looks down. Doubled up on that this week because SMU yeah. falls to Maryland, right? We didn't see that coming. Houston, who was ranked just last week, loses at home to Kansas. To Kansas. Two straight weeks. Two, Two straight, straight weeks. Lose. Yep. I caught it. Temple loses to Rutgers, whatever. Cincinnati kept it close to Miami, Ohio, probably longer than they wanted to. And then, all the, honestly, Tulane gets the biggest win of the American, beating Kansas State. They're 3-0. and They're on UCF Tulane schedule. Tulane looks good. Yeah, they're on UCF schedule for the end of the year. So, again, I mean, the sky was falling six days ago, seven days ago, whatever it is, and now it's looking up again. And when I look at the American, I sit back and I go, you know, again, which one of these teams is, ta- is more talented than UCF? Not Probably many. None of them. Not, it's not just, many of them. It just comes down to execution and, and not having boneheaded plays. And my goodness, not to bury the lead, no more Daniel Obarski. How (laughs) great was it? Okay, he's probably a good young kid, okay? I get it. But how great was it not to see him on my television screen tonight? Gus Malzahn sending a message. I don't even care that Boomer missed an extra point. I don't care. I watched a field goal that was past 40 yards go through the uprights. I watched it. I seen it with you literally. And didn't have to cover my eyes watching it. No, I did not. I don't even care. Yeah, I literally felt so confident. I'm like, you kick it, Boomer. <laughs> you kick it. You kick that thing. Hell I, you stole, Hell I was literally going to bring it up. Yeah. Oh, I mean, come on. Colton Boomer. Oh, he always That's such about, a great kicker it. name, too. Colton Boomer. Oh. oh, and he was booming them. He, like, I get the extra point. Okay. He was going straight down the middle on all the kicks. I'm like, oh, thank you. I mean, thank you, Colton. I, I love you already. I was going to talk about it, too. I was like, okay, this is a good way to end it. We can just talk about... The punt was great. You loved the punt. I know it was straight. It didn't go out of bounds on the, you know, it was straight. It went 46 and yards. Then, I'm taking it. I know. <laughs> I know, d- dude. I know. I'm like, listen, I'm fine with it. Give can me, we, give can me we my deactivate, field goals. Can we deactivate the uh, Did Obarski miss Twitter account after tonight? I hope so. Can we give it I a think little good deactivation? Yeah, no, I think... I think he's gone. I think I don't, I don't need to see. I don't. Right. I don't need to see 98 on my screen ever again. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good for one lifetime. We, but here's the thing. We appreciate Obar- We we appreciate Dan Obarski for yeah, all kid. the kicks he yeah. did make and all the games he played in. I mean, uh, again, they are student athletes. I get that, but when you're in this spot, you you have to be critical. And I mean, he did miss some kicks that were just like, "What are you doing?" So I think we are all very happy. I know I sent some nice voice messages to you guys when <laughs> I saw Mister Thirty Five, Mister Boomer walking on the scene. I'm like, "Oh yes, Boomer, kick some field goals for me, sir." I'm like, "It's a forty-two yarder." I'm like, "Oh no, okay, wait, it's it's Colton Boomer though. It's Boomer. Let's go." And he nails it right down the middle. I'm like, "Let's go. Give me those three points." It was that that might have honestly, swear to God, first half might have been like one of my favorite things. I'm like, thank you for making that field goal, which I never thought I would say as a football fan. But um, and the jokes have already yeah, started. The can... jokes have already started. People I heard on the broadcast all over Twitter. Okay, boomer. Okay, boomer. Okay, it's, boomer. It's already started. I mean, I'll take it. I mean, oh, just, absolutely. He's got a cool catchphrase. It's too good of a name. It's too good of a name. Yeah, I got to get we have to get like, you know, shirts for our podcast, but like with his just boomer. Like let's go boomer and have his face on it. And go, go to the games. I mean, I think that we've got to do that. I mean, he might be one of my favorite players and I've only seen him kick for one game. But my girlfriend said he looked very young and I'm like, "Yeah, he's a freshman." And she goes, "Yeah, he looks very young." And I'm like, 
listen, I don't care how young he looks. He makes my Get extra points and my – that's all we need. When our offense tails out or stalls out, you make my you make uh, three extra points and one point, and we're happy. All right, great game. We're on to Georgia Tech. That should be a fun one. I don't know if I'm going to go to the game. Are we are we going to the game? I don't know. Should we go? Uh, yeah, we're going to go probably. We're probably going to go. I'm going to stay in my confines of Tampa. Um, he lives in Tampa, guys. So let's not roast him in the comments, okay? I mean. I know Nick has a lot of fans. He lives in Tampa. Driving two hours for him is taxing. He's an old man, um, so, so you can't tell on this. You can't tell with my lighting here, which is not ideal. But there are there are a lot of gray hairs in here. I'm getting a little older, and I'm grumpier. I can't. The drive for me, I'm very grumpy there and back. So I'm gonna pick and choose my spots to be in the bounce house this year. Georgia Tech will not be one of them. Well. We will talk more about Georgia Tech this week on our next episode, because um, yeah, that's a big game. I mean, you're get, let's not it, you're you're facing a real opponent. I don't care what the record is. I don't care what it says. I don't care what the games say. Did that with Louisville, which I think will help UCF going into this game because Gus will probably show them the record and show them the the points and say. And then they'll go right back to the Louisville game with Syracuse and say, we took advantage of them last time where we're thinking they're a completely different team and we're playing them at home. So let's not uh, let's not have another Louisville situation at home with all your fans uh, making the place rocking. But I think that'll do it. Anything else? Anything else you guys want to add for this nice night's dub on a now Sunday morning? No, it just it just feels good to finally be in the win column to have something positive because I don't enjoy coming on here and talking bad about my alma mater. I don't, regardless of what you might believe, Mr. Green. I don't. I was I just say, as, bro, I was I so say good. I want to say good things. I want JRP to work out. JRP ten. I want that all to work out. So yes, I, I'm very satisfied with what I saw tonight. It was everything I need to see and then some. And I feel a lot more better about UCF situation. And now this is probably going to be a reactionary thing, and I'm probably going to be week to week on this. Not going to lie Pretty to much. you, probably. But hey, like I said, 600 something yards of offense and giving up zero in the third quarter. Thumbs up from me. I'm taking it. Rob, final thoughts? I'm going to bed happy tonight. It's a good way to end it. It's a great way to end it. This has been Charge On. We appreciate you. Like, subscribe, share, comment, do all those things. Great comments on the last episode. We really appreciate all the support and love. Um, I think that's it. We will see you this week uh, to preview Georgia Tech. And, yeah, Knights beat those owls down in Boca Raton, 40-14. to 14. This has been Charge On. We will see you guys this week.